I just finished a most delightful task. I was uh, given the opportunity to write a biography about the Powell family of 817 North Avenue in Grand Rapids. Uh, they were highly influential in my life, and uh, it's the 100th anniversary of Gospel Folio Press. Bill Pell started the press initially uh, making gospel tracts out of scraps of wallpaper left over from his father's paint and wallpaper business. But um, then he got a little hand press and began to print tracts in his mother's parlor. And that was in uh, 1923, and so just a hundred years now. And so we've come out with a commemorative edition of the biography of the Pell family. It includes uh, more than 50 stories, wonderful stories of answered prayer, souls being saved, miracles that God has done. It really is quite a thrilling book, along with the narrative of the Pell family themselves. I was going to tell a story out of the book, but I'm not going to do that. I won't steal their thunder. But I would like to just uh, expand on a little incident that I mentioned in the book. But before I do that, I would like to um, remind you of two verses in the New Testament from the pen of the Apostle Paul. One is Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, which begins with these words, that I may know him. And then in Ephesians 6, 19, he asked the Christians to pray for him, quote, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And so these were the two great passions of the Apostle Paul to know him and to make him known. And that certainly was the case of the Pell family. Well, in the book, I mentioned very briefly that um, Peter Pell, one of the one of the four preacher brothers, um, his warm devotional teaching was greatly appreciated, and he traveled widely to proclaim the word of God. And this is what I wrote. It didn't seem to matter where he began his Bible reading. He always led you to Christ. Gilles, this was a young man that I met, Gilles Gauthier and his dear wife, Lorette, a young believer from Quebec City who was moving to Grand Rapids for studies, was handed a note by a friend before he left. Quote, if you want to meet a man who can't speak for five minutes without talking about the Lord Jesus, go and see this man. The name on the note was Peter Pell. Well, just a little background. Gilles, uh, raised in a Catholic home, uh, attended uh, the university, I believe Laval University, was taking a philosophy course, and um, most of the other students in the class were going through for the Catholic priesthood. But he noticed that there were two students in the class and they carried little black books with them. He wondered what they were, but when issues came up in the class, they would refer to these little books and read them as authoritative. And he discovered that they were actually New Testaments. And uh, these two young people led Gilles to the Lord. Well, he like the Apostle Paul, began preaching right away. He just went out on the street and he knew he was saved and he began to preach the gospel. And a Baptist group got a hold of him, they discipled him, and they decided to send him to the Baptist Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And that's how he ended up getting this little scrap of paper with the name of Peter Pell. But he moved to Grand Rapids, it was busy, everything that was involved in getting registered and getting his classes and uh, getting a place for his family to stay and so on, he kind of forgot about that little piece of paper. But he said, you know, as I went out to these churches, there was something very different here. He said, uh, there was in his French accent, he said, uh, a great deal of the honor of men, praising men, exalting men. And he said, I was looking for a place where they gave all the honor to the Lord. And so it was that he started traveling around the city of Grand Rapids, 
until one morning, Sunday morning, he saw a sign out in front of a building, Northwest Gospel Hall, and it said that they had worship for an hour and a half on Sunday morning. He immediately parked his car. It was already past the starting time. He slipped in and sat near the back, and he said halfway through the meeting, suddenly an old man stood to his feet. And he said, he lifted me right into heaven. And afterwards, he rushed up to the man and found out that it was, in fact, Peter Pell. Now, what's interesting, especially interesting about this story, is that Peter Pell, a few weeks before, had been in Florida having meetings. And he had had a heart attack or a stroke, I'm not sure which. And um, they had taken him to the hospital there. Then he was released. He came back to Michigan and actually uh, got a, a room at Rest Haven Homes. This was the only Sunday that he was able to come out to the Lord's Supper at Northwest. After that, he began to lose strength and he attended a little Lord's Supper at Rest Haven Homes after that. He lived on for quite some months, and Jill started going over to Peter Pell's little room. He would sit on the floor. He would ask him Bible questions, and Peter would pour into Jill the glorious truths as uh, he spoke of knowing him and making him known. Well, meanwhile, back at the seminary, um, the professors noticed a new flavor in all of Gilles' writing. And uh, finally, he was on a scholarship. And finally, they called him in and said, listen, we are not going to pay your way through the Baptist seminary so you can go and start Brethren Churches. And he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Who are, what, what are Brethren Churches? I've never heard of this. We know you've been in contact with the Brethren. Why is that? Well, because we see in your writings that devotional style focusing on Christ, and we, we think you've been in contact with the brethren. He said, I've just been sitting listening to an old man, and every time I ask him a question, he will say to me, turn to this passage of scripture, and then I will read the scripture, and he'll make a few comments on it. I ask another question, and he will say, turn to this passage of scripture. That's all I've been doing, and that's all he's been doing. Well, you know, they they finally said, we, we're just not going to do this, but they were afraid of throwing him out of the school because he had stood up against a professor who had denied the, uh, the verbal plainer inspiration of scripture. And so the school was afraid that if they put him out of the seminary, he would cause an upset about this professor. He wasn't going to do that, but they, they were afraid that, that he would uh, uh, cause trouble. And so they scrimped and saved. He said, you know, eventually they found actually more money for me uh, to not only pay for my tuition, uh, my books and so on, but every all my living expenses so that I, I wouldn't leave the school. And, uh, and he quoted the scripture to me, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. But I'll never forget going to his uh, little apartment. His dear wife, Lorette, had made a lovely supper. And uh, while I was waiting for the supper to be prepared, I was sitting reading one of the manuscripts of one of his papers that he had prepared for the seminary. And I said, Gilles, this is lovely. This is very good. And he said, ah, he said, when I wrote that paper, I committed blasphemy. I said, what? He said, yes. He said, I wrote that whole paper and not once did I bow down in worship. That, he said, is blasphemy. He said, there's a lot of blasphemy committed here. <sighs> Dear Christian, it's not only to make him known. You can't truly make him known unless you know him in an intimate and personal way. And when we do, then he manifests himself through us to others. May God help us 
to, to commit to these two foci, these two glorious centers of truth in the Word of God, around which everything else gathers. On the one hand, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. And Ephesians 6.19, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, to know him and to make him known.